Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Welcome to Rosenstiel School. Uh, I am your host for the evening, Professor Vaith Chariath. I direct the Aircraft Center for Earth Studies. We are in for an extra special treat tonight. Uh, we have our special guest, Ms. Laura Trithui, uh, who just came in from San Diego. Hello. <laughs> Hamilton. <laughs> um, and uh, this is the second of the Sea Secrets lecture series. I will share a little bit about uh, Laura's uh, history and a short excerpt from her latest book review. She has written a new nonfiction book, The Deepest Map, which is available for sale outside the quarter, I noticed, about the incredible race to map the entire ocean floor by 2030. Her first book, The Imperiled Ocean, was about human stories from a changing sea and a collection of nonfiction essays about what people do on and in the ocean. She just came from a long cruise out in, um, on the Nautilus and has firsthand experience what deep sea mapping is like. She has appeared, her work has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Atlantic, The Sierra Magazine, The Hakai Magazine, and The Walrus, among other publications. She's written professionally for over a decade and was the senior writer and editor for the Vancouver Aquarium storytelling website, ocean.org, where she wrote and produced weekly videos about the sea. She finished her Master's of Fine Arts with the, at the University of British Columbia's Creative Writing Program and currently lives in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, where she teaches creative writing at the Sheridan College. I'll share a short excerpt from the New York Times book review on the deepest map. A worldwide push is currently underway to have the sea's cold, dark depths fully mapped, with the work to be completed by the end of this decade, no less. Laura Trithui, a Canadian writer long captivated by matters maritime, has written the deepest map, a gripping and all too timely account of what in more ways than one is turning out to be a very costly and necessary race to the bottom. Trithui rises to the occasion here, relating in absorbing detail the ebb and flow of conflicting interests that tussle down among the vents and ridges of the Haddle Zone. It is all highly readable and it is all deeply ominous. The author's words should be required reading. Those tempted to turn away from their implications should imagine the dire possibilities enabled by the new maps. Armadas of mining ships loaded with cranes and drums of cable and giant claws and submarine dragline excavators all jostling for space above those still uncharted places where cobalt and nickel and zinc and gold are known to lie. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Ms. Laura Trithui to the stage and thank you all for coming. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. <laughs> louder? A little louder? Okay. Um, my name is Laura Trithui, and uh, I'm really, really glad to be here tonight. Um, I have just been treated so well the last 24 hours. Thank you, Ved, for that amazing introduction to Tatiana and Cheryl Stone and to Jennifer for showing me around the campus, all the amazing people I met today. And to see you all here, this is, this is incredible. It just really warms my heart to be able to tell you all about ocean mapping and why we should all care about the bottom of the ocean. Um, I'd like to take a moment to just introduce you to an ocean mapper. This is Cassie Bongiovanni. And many of you have probably never heard of her, but she's a main character in The Deepest Map. Um, she has done extraordinary things that no one else in the history of humanity has ever done before. And she's just turning 30 years old. So Cassie was the lead ocean mapper on the Five Deeps expedition, which was this um, big expedition that took place a couple years ago to send the first person to the bottom of all five oceans. The problem is, is that when this expedition began, we didn't know where the deepest points of all five oceans were. So we knew, so to back up a little bit, we knew that the deepest point of the oceans overall was in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench is the absolute deepest point in the ocean. But the rest of the oceans were pretty much a big mystery. And I remember finding that very astonishing when I first learned that. Like, how do we not know that? How have we mapped the human genome and sent uh, robots to Mars, but we don't even know the limits of the ocean? 
And so Cassie gets herself a job on this expedition and she goes out to find those deepest points on the planet. And she's 25 years old, she's fresh out of university, and she goes away for a year and a half on this privately funded expedition, paid for by this multimillionaire explorer, Victor Vescovo. And he also paid tens of millions of dollars to build a state-of-the-art submersible that would get him to the bottom of uh, the deepest points of all five oceans. And if you've heard of anybody from this expedition, you've probably heard of Victor. He tends to get a lot of the glory for this expedition. Um, he's become the world record holder now. But it's really Cassie, this shy, goofy millennial, <laughs> who um, did the lion's share of the work on that expedition, um, finding him the deepest points on the planet to dive. And she's, in my opinion, a bit of a, a hidden figure in the world of ocean exploration. This picture was taken in the Indian Ocean. Um, this is right around the time that Cassie discovers that the deepest point in the Indian Ocean is not in the Diamantina fracture zone, which is um, where it was commonly believed to be the deepest point of the Indian Ocean. It's right off Australia. And she found out that it was actually hundreds of miles away in the Java Trench off Indonesia. And so here she is just casually upending some foundational knowledge about the Indian Ocean. So there's two quests that I'm, I'm charting in the, the deepest map. Um, Cassie is on a quest to map the deepest points of all five oceans, but there's this other quest called Seabed 2030, and she's sharing maps from her expedition into this giant super map of the ocean. So Seabed 2030 is this global initiative uh, kicked off in 2017, and it's trying to make the first complete map of the world's ocean by the end of the decade. And they're gonna make all those maps free and publicly available to whoever wants them. This map was made by one of the Seabed 2030 mappers back in 2019. And around that time, um, this is exactly when Cassie started uh, her trip on board the Five Deeps. And at that point, less than 20% of the global ocean was mapped. And this map really puts into context uh, what we've mapped so far versus what we haven't. So um, all the black stuff is uncharted ocean. And um, it's never been mapped by sonar. In some cases, a ship has never gone there at all. Um, and the colored bits are what we have mapped. So you can see that it's mostly around, like Europe is, there's a lot of good maps around the Mediterranean and the Baltic Sea and the North Sea. Florida has got some good maps, but then you go off of um, the west coast of Africa, the east coast of South America, and it's pretty dark. So why haven't we mapped the seafloor? There's a lot of good reasons why we haven't mapped the seafloor. Um, it's huge. It's 71% of the planet. It is incomprehensibly vast. A big part of this book was just me trying to wrap my head around how big the ocean was. Um, it's also really deep. It's two and a half miles deep on average. And the best way to map the ocean today is, is still with an ocean mapper, going out to sea for days or weeks or months at a time, and they survey the seafloor with sound. So with a sonar that sends out a ping, uh, travels down to the seafloor, bounces and returns to the ship. So sort of like a, a bat clicking its way around a dark cave. And it's a really time consuming process. The ship usually travels pretty slowly, so like eight to 10 knots, and they do what's called mowing the lawn. So they just go back and forth across the ocean in these big, <laughs> taking off sections at a time. Um, and there's storms going on while they're doing this. There's fog, there's wind, there's waves. Um, the corrosive salt water is breaking down equipment. So it's just a really challenging and really expensive place to work. But practical reasons aside, we can map the entire ocean. We've had the tools and the technology 
to do it for decades. It's challenging, it's expensive, but humans have done lots of challenging things. So why haven't we done this? And that's sort of the larger question of the deepest map. Like, why haven't we done this? And what would it take to finally do this, to finish this? So, <laughs> I would like to introduce you to someone else. Um, when people ask what's the point of ocean mapping, why are we doing all this, why are we filling in the map, I like to bring up Marie Tharp, who is also very much a hidden figure in the world of ocean mapping and ocean exploration, I should say. And she's really, a, I see her as a precursor to someone like Cassie Bongiovanni. She's a cartographer. She was a cartographer at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory in New York during the post-war Cold War period. And Marie was a bit of a curious character for her time. She's single, she's a divorcee, she's working in science at a time when not a lot of women are working in science and they're not really welcome in science either. At the same time, there were lots of phenomenal leaps and bounds being made in ocean mapping because it's the Cold War and there's a lot of investments being made in anti-submarine warfare. And so Marie finds herself in the right place at the wrong time. And the biggest hurdle for Marie is that she's not allowed to go to sea to survey the seafloor herself. Um, no women were allowed on research vessels in America at that time. At Lamont, they weren't even allowed to set foot on the gangplank. But Marie manages to get around that restriction by forging this sort of part scientific, part romantic partnership with a scientist called Bruce Heason. And she goes out and she, he goes out and collects the soundings at sea and he brings them back to Marie on land who sort of painstakingly plots them on a map. And you can see the maps behind her. And one of the first things she notices is that there's this big ridge in the middle of the Atlantic and it's snaking all the way down the ocean. And it immediately dawns on her that this is where new earth is bubbling up out of the center and pushing the continents further and further apart. And so today we all know that continental drift is true and that there was once a big supercontinent called Pangaea, but back then in the 1950s, particularly in American geological circles, to believe in continental drift was like heresy. It was a, it was a career killer. And um, you know, scientists who did believe in it were called drifters, which is like calling someone crazy. <laughs> um, but Marie doesn't, she, she, she keeps going. She keeps drawing her maps and all the new soundings are pouring in and she's finding more and more evidence that this ridge is not only in the Atlantic, but that it's continuing into the Southern Ocean, the Indian Ocean, all over the Pacific. It does this sort of wobbly line 40,000 miles around the Earth. And then this map comes out. It's published in National Geographic in 1967, and it's a map of the Indian Ocean painted by, the, uh, by an Austrian painter and it's based on the maps that Marie's been drawing for nearly two decades at this point. There's actually a, an amazing globe uh, in the library here that looks just like this. I saw it through a window today and was like, stop, gotta go check that out. It was, it was uh, incredible. So this map is the first modern glimpse of the seafloor that anyone's really ever seen. And you can clearly see this, this ridge running through it. And 1967 is a really pivotal moment in geological circles because the debate around continental drift is kind of coming to a head. And there's also this new emerging theory of plate tectonics. And then this map comes out. And this map really helps pave the way for scientists, but also for the general public to accept and understand that these two theories are true because everyone can see it right there on the map, that the seafloor is not dead, boring earth where things go to die. It's where it's, there's mountains, there's canyons, there's valleys. Um, it's bisected by all these mid-ocean ridges and trenches and interlocking plates. And so Marie's maps really give us a glimpse of this new earth-shattering view. And in my opinion, they, they really change the world and how we look at the world. So here's a really different view of the Indian Ocean. Um, 
we have way better maps of the seafloor today. Um, this is a bathymetric map, and it's what you usually see in scientific papers today about new maps that are made. Um, it's, a, it's a map of seafloor depth. And um, each color here represents a descending depth. So the reds and yellows are shallower than the greens and blues. And if you talk to an ocean mapper, or if you talk to Cassie Bongiovanni, say, about what she sees on this map, she'll probably talk about the seamounts, she'll talk about all the ridges, she'll point out little ridges and dimples, um, because to ocean mappers, this map is a work of art. It's a huge achievement. They know how much work went into getting this done. And this map was actually, uh, this picture is actually really interesting in a lot of ways because this was made during the search for the Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 in the Indian Ocean. And during that expedition, um, took a huge amount of ships, uh, ships from all different countries. They were out there for a phenomenal amount of time, um, all surveying the seafloor together. And they mapped 279,000 square kilometers of seafloor for the first time. And while they were out there, they discovered two 19th century shipwrecks that no one knew was out there. So besides shipwrecks and learning about plate tectonics, why else should we map the seafloor? There's some big societal reasons why we should map the seafloor. So um, tsunamis, earthquakes, rising sea levels, climate change. Um, Cassie Bongiovanni, after she mapped the deepest points of all five oceans, she actually went on to map um, the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is this volatile, seismically active trench that rims the largest ocean on Earth, the Pacific. And most of the world's devastating earthquakes and volcanic eruptions emanate from the Ring of Fire. And yet most of those trenches are really poorly mapped, poorly understood. And Cassie went and mapped eight of them herself. But one of my favorite reasons to map the ocean and to continue exploring the ocean is that the greatest mystery of all time is down there, which is where did life begin? We know it started somewhere in the ocean many years ago, and we know it probably happened at a hydrothermal vent, maybe like this one. Um, until the first hydrothermal vent was discovered in 1977, everyone thought that life on Earth was photosynthetic, that it you know, needed the sun to survive. But there was this evolutionary puzzle um, because marine life, like sponges, were, were way older than life found on land. And we couldn't figure out how life had started in water until these hydrothermal vents were discovered. And all these animals were found clustered around um, these underwater hot springs, sort of feasting off of the minerals in the water. And it just, it upended our entire understanding of, of life on Earth. Life can be chemosynthetic too. And, um, Another interesting thing that I like to point out about hydrothermal vents is that you know, scientists are still studying them today. Um, and this one in particular is uh, from a hydrothermal vent field in the Atlantic called the Lost City. And there's been about 20 years of work on this hydrothermal vent field. And they think that it could be a good candidate for looking for um, what life might look like on distant planets. So in other words, <laughs> if we keep mapping and exploring the ocean, we could discover the secret to life on Earth, and we could find aliens. <laughs> OK, and so this is one of those animals that are found on hydrothermal vents. Um, this is a Yeti crab. It was a, yeah, I guess you can figure out why. Um, it was first discovered in 2005 on a hydrothermal vent along the Pacific Antarctic Ridge, um, which is south of Eastern Island. And it's got this really charismatic fur along its arms and legs. And it likes to cluster near those hydrothermal vents. Warm water is seeping out of the seafloor. And um, Yeti crabs have been observed sort of dancing and like waving their arms. Uh, these hairy arms over the, over the mineral-rich water that's kind of coming out of the seafloor. And it was discovered that these crabs are actually farming bacteria on their furry arms that they sort of collect and eat. 
it sounds gross, <laughs> but it's kind of ingenious that these, that these Yeti crabs figured out a way to harvest food in the deep sea. Okay, so what are people gonna do with this map when we finish mapping the seafloor? So this is a picture of a deep sea mining machine called a nodule collector. And it's about the size of an army tank. And this would be lowered down to the seafloor, two and a half miles deep or so, and it would kind of go chomping across a very fragile deep sea environment. It's dark, it's stable, it's been cold for millennia down there, and it would hoover up these manganese nodules to a sort of waiting ship above. And manganese nodules are these sort of potato-sized rocks, um, and they lie loose on the deep sea, on the deep sea floor, and they have nickel and magnesium, uh, uh, manganese, uh, cobalt, and a lot, of, a lot of other rare earth elements that are really critical for sustainable technology right now, like um, electrical vehicle batteries. And so people, when they think of maps, I think they often think of mining, they think of colonialism, they think of kings and empires sort of waging war or seizing resources. And when I started researching this book, um, there was concern that Seabed 2030 was gonna accelerate mining because it was going to like pinpoint the resources um, by creating that first publicly available map of the seafloor. But then I found out that um, deep sea miners actually already had all the good maps of those areas that they intended to mine. Um, they'd had those since the 1970s or 1980s. CBIT 2030 is, is really an academic venture. It's mostly scientists uh, running it. It doesn't have the money to map the whole seafloor by itself. It has to rely on governments or the military or companies, deep sea mining companies sometimes, to donate data to their giant super map of the world. And so most of the advanced deep sea mining projects today are focused on manganese nodules and, and mining scenarios like that. Um, some are focused on the hydrothermal vents that I was talking about. There's prospecting going on there as well. And one of the biggest concerns with deep sea mining is the tailings. After the nodules are sucked up to the mining ship, the tailings would then be pumped back down into the ocean, so the, the non-useful bits would, would be pumped back down. And these tailings could be full of heavy metals and toxins from the, the crushed ore. And these sediment plumes, they could spread out over a vast area. The proposed mining sites themselves are vast. Um, the most popular one is called the Clarion Clipperton uh, zone in the Pacific. It's about halfway between uh, Hawaii and Mexico, and it's roughly the size of Europe. But that's really nothing compared to how far the tailings could spread. Um, deep sea mining proponents, they say that uh, the tailings could spread maybe six miles. Um, others say that it could travel hundreds of miles because there's no land or borders to stop the swirling sediment. And just to paint a picture of what this could do to a normally clear environment is that this toxic dust could drag down jellyfish drifting in the water column. It could suffocate filter feeding animals like clams and sponges. It could absorb the light that bioluminescent animals use to feed and communicate. And there's also a lot of animals migrating through these sites, so um, these mining sites. So, Whale sharks, turtles, um, tuna is a, is a big industry there. And that's particularly worrisome for human health because if um, tuna migrate through and ingest some of this sediment, it could potentially work its way up into the human, into the human food chain and uh, affect human health as well. So there's been a lot of debate over how deep the tailing should be pumped down so it could mitigate the impact of, of this, um, the toxic metals. Um, and so the number that's generally tossed around is that the tailings should be pumped down to about 330 feet deep. And the reason for that is that if they're pumped down a little bit, then they won't spread as far. If you, pump th if you release them at the surface, they'll spread out way farther. So you wanna pump them further down into the water column. Um, 330 feet 
deep though is, is not super deep, considering that the mining sites are about two and a half miles deep. Okay. But then uh, in January, Uh, 2023, um, a group of environmental organizations released this video, and it was shot, well, so this is just showing what the actual process would look like, and um, this is a ship run by All Seas, which um, the metals company, the leading deep sea mining company, uh, had rented this ship. And you can see here tailings being pumped directly into the surface of the ocean. So instead of being pumped down into the water column, they're just being released right there. Uh, and the metals company would say that this was just a temporary glitch, that they fixed it relatively quickly. But this highlighted a major problem with deep sea mining, which is that things go wrong at sea uh, all the time. Stuff breaks down, stuff gets lost. Um, it's going to be hugely expensive to work offshore for months and years at a time. And when things go wrong out there, unless we get videos like that, um, we'll never hear about it. So the mining companies would probably say that these risks are worth it, that we need these metals to transition to a carbon-free economy, and that it's better environmentally to mine the deep sea now rather than tropical rainforests. But there's a lot of skepticism around this claim, even in the business community, because there's a big glut of nickel and lithium on the market right now. Prices have collapsed, mines are closing in Australia. Um, so how are we gonna fund this new experimental industry if the returns aren't that high? And the thing is, is that this has happened before. There was a lot of deep sea mining interest in the 70s and 80s, and then the Cold War ended, and metal prices collapsed, and the whole industry just went on hiatus for decades. So who's in charge of deep sea mining? Um, international waters, or rather the seabed in international waters, is regulated by this relatively obscure organization called the International Seabed Authority in Jamaica. And this is a picture of me sitting at, um, in the council meeting chambers of the ISA, in December 2021. And they hold meetings in this room twice a year with the governments of the world where they discuss regulations on deep sea mining, which are edging closer to developing a mining code all the time. And that would permit commercial mining to, to move ahead. Right now, we're still in the exploration phase. So no governments, no companies are actually allowed to sell deep sea minerals from the international seabed on the open market. And this, this UN-associated regulator, the ISA, they employ just a few dozen people, um, which is kind of astounding to me because they're responsible for managing 50% of the Earth's surface, which, like, it's, it's hard to get, like, a couple dozen people to run a city, let, <laughs> let alone half the planet. And so I was also shocked when I was there um, because a few of the mining companies actually sat on the delegations of various countries and were sort of advising the governments as they spoke. At one meeting, the CEO of the metals company, which is like the leading company in this field, um, actually spoke on behalf of Nauru, which is um, this tiny, impoverished Pacific Island nation that supports deep sea mining. And that really shook up the whole council. That was like the talk of the town. And while, while I was there, I had to sit at the side part with all the other observers from the Pew Institute, Greenpeace was there, DOSI, DSCC, and we didn't get to comment very much on what was going on in like the center of the room, um, which I thought was really interesting because we represented civil society, basically. Um, so there's a lot of countries that really want to see this happen uh, quickly. So China, Japan, India, the Cook Islands, they're eager to get going. Um, at the same time, there's also growing opposition to deep sea mining um, amongst civil society, but also in, amongst some governments too. So over 700 ocean science, 
Scientists have now signed a petition uh, saying that they want to put some pause on deep sea mining until we know more about the seabed. And 24 governments, the last time I counted, have said they also want some kind of pause on development. Um, so the UK, Mexico, Germany, a couple other ones, they've all asked for a pause. Um, and major corporations have also said that they would like to, they, they don't want to buy deep sea minerals. So um, Google, Volkswagen, Samsung, uh, a, a lot of major ones have said they won't buy them. And so these two things are kind of going on at the same time, and it really remains an open question every time the ISA meets. Um, they're meeting again in March um, in this room, and there'll be a lot of pressure back and forth on whether we should go ahead and start commercial mining or whether we should, we should pause here and take a minute. So I wanted to end on a more hopeful story. Um, some news that came out of uh, Florida relatively recently. So last month, a newly published study revealed that right off the coast of Florida is one of the world's largest deep sea coral reef habitats that's ever been discovered. Uh, it's bigger than Vermont, and it's this vast underwater feature that snakes up along the coastline from Miami all the way to Charleston. Um, and it's as thick as 68 miles in parts. And you can see here on the, this bathymetric map that there's these big mounds, and those are corals, um, big clusters of corals. And this is what those corals look like. Um, now, these corals might seem a little different from your typical shallow water corals, and that's because they're deep water reefs. Um, so the white color is healthy. It doesn't mean they're bleaching. <laughs> And this type of coral, it doesn't rely on sunlight or symbiotic algae. They, can, they build these hard reefs by filtering food from the seawater and then grow hundreds of meters high in some places. They're so thick, they can disrupt currents and they're, they're home to so many different species. Uh, they support so much biodiversity. Now what's interesting is that where this was found is uh, off Florida is a place called the, the Blake Plateau. And it was once thought of as so devoid of sea life that the first deep sea mining experiments actually happened there in the 1970s. Um, they were raking up manganese nodules just 100 kilometers from where the thickest parts of these reefs were. And an expedition, a NOAA expedition, recently went back to those early mining test sites and that they saw that the seafloor and some of the animals had still not recovered. Um, luckily, those experiments never damaged the, the massive coral reefs that we didn't know existed yet. Um, but what's extraordinary to me is that we're still discovering things like this all the time. This month, uh, a South Carolina exploration company thinks that they may have discovered the final resting place of Amelia Earhart's plane um, by surveying over 5,000 square miles of ocean. And things like that are happening all the time. Um, so I know that sometimes the, the deep sea and bathymetric maps can look kind of dark and scary and in, inhospitable to humans, and they are in a lot of cases. But when I was writing The Deepest Map, I really found that it was, it was the opposite a lot of the time. Um, there's a, a lot of humanity there, too. So there's figuring out the mysteries of life on Earth. Um, there's um, exploring the recent past of shipwrecks and downed airplanes. And there's the future of you know, maybe mining the deep sea and, and what might life might look like on distant planets. And so for me, ocean mapping really became a quest to understand ourselves, um, where we're coming, where, we're, where we came from, where we're going, and what it means to be human. I'm gonna end it there. Thanks for having me. Of a, as someone who works in this field, it's, it's really remarkable to, to see this. So thank you for sharing your story and your work that you do. I will turn it over now to Jennifer Dillon, who will host our, our Q&A session. 
Thank you, thank you all. I wanted to um, I wanted to make sure that we thank our sponsors for this uh, for this event. For without their support, we would not have Sea Secrets every year. It's a great event. All of our sponsors here: the, she the Shepherd Broad Foundation, William J. Galway III, Cheryl Gold, the KB Life Enhancement Forum, Key Biscayne Community Foundation, Joan McCann Family Foundation, Nicole and Myron Wang. Seeing or DeForest Stedman Foundation and the Southern Glaciers Wine and Spirits. Thank you so much for your sponsorship. So if you would like to learn more about our mission here at Rosensteel, thank you again for coming. You can uh, check our website out. It's earth.miami.edu. And you can contact me if you're interested in helping us with our student scholarships or becoming a sponsor of Sea Secrets or if you would like to learn more about the, the, our initiatives and our pillars at the Rosensteel School. Um, one of the things I'd like to say here, I'm going to give a little bit of a direction before the end of this, uh, the lecture here. We're going to do some, uh, some questions, but what we're going to do is we're going to have a book signing after this and we're going to have everybody line up on the right to your right as you're sitting in there in the audience. And uh, Laura will meet you at the top of the stairs. We have some tables up there. If you'd like to buy the book, you can purchase it up there. Also, if you're online with us, you can purchase it from booksandbooks.com. And um, we look forward to all of your questions. If you want to come up here, and we'll, we'll start that out. We're going to send our students up through the uh, through the audience here, and if you just raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question, and we'll hand you the microphone. Please uh, speak into the microphone, and then once your question is finished, hand it back to the student, please. Thank you. Hi. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Um, I just uh, wonder if you have worked with or are familiar with on like outreach or education or conservation efforts with a couple of authors I've read recently, Susan Casey, who wrote The Underworld Journeys in the Depths of the Ocean, um, Sylvia Earle, and the third one that I can think of off the top of my head, Dr. Edith Witter, who wrote Below the Edge of Darkness, who studies bioluminescence in the abyss and the hadal zones. I'm sure there's more, but I, those three came to mind. wonder if you... Yeah, yeah, um, I think my book came out a month before Susan Casey's. <laughs> And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're, Susan Casey's a big hero of mine. Um, she has written about dolphins and um, dolphin language, marine mammal language. Um, she has written about waves and um, every book of hers that I read, um, I love. And for this book, we, for The Deepest Map, she and I were basically writing about the same expedition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Susan, though, managed to get on a submersible. <laughs> I think that, you know, once you're, you're um, Susan Casey, you get to go on a submersible. <laughs> I, I tried my best to get on one, and I didn't get on a submersible. Um, I emailed everybody I knew. I was talking about how I, Ray Dalio, if you're watching, I still want to get on a submersible. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, uh, it was an experience that I always wanted. And um, since the Triton submersible has imploded, and I tell that to people, uh, they are like flabbergasted, like why would you ever want to do that? Um, but submersibles are relatively safe, um, and you can see incredible things down there. So um, it's still a, a bucket list dream of mine. So yeah. 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 Thank you so much for that question. Yeah, John Van Leer here. Um, I was a student at, at uh, MIT in Woods Hole in the old days with Bob Ballard, who was uh, somebody who went down to the, the deep ocean. There was a, a lady named Betty Bunce at Woods Hole who was similar to the, uh, the people at Lamont Darty that you referred to. She actually went to sea. Yeah, she was she, an she explosive expert, right? She was a take-no-prisoners right? kind of a lady. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we, we had one here at, at Miami as well, who was uh, early going to sea when women were not supposed to go. Um, and so uh, thank you for uh, highlighting 
uh, some of these early women who did this work. Uh, Bob Ballard went down to the, the spreading centers for the first time in, in Alvin, and I was using the Alvin for doing midwater mixing experiments with Klaus Root. And uh, fascinating thing, I, my question is, I wonder when uh, or if we will colonize the, the uh, hydrothermal systems using the energy uh, from the hydrothermal systems to, to create a, a habitat down on, on the mid-ocean ridge, much like the plans for habitats on the moon or Mars. Wow, okay, yeah, you know, I have not heard that reference before. <laughs> I, I've, um, you're right about Betty Bunce. Uh, she was an explosive expert, I think. Um, things, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and Betty was sort of this exception to the rule. For some reason, she managed to get on a lot of ships that other women didn't get on. I'm not exactly sure what her magic they was. Were right, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, and um, Marie Tharp did eventually get a trip on board a, a vessel. So the rules did change, um, I think in like the early 70s, something like that. Fascinatingly, um, it was Russian scientists, Russian female scientists that actually managed to change a lot of the rules around um, American female scientists because some Russian, uh, Russian women had been working on research vessels for a long time and um, some very uh, respected Russian scientists came over to work on an American ship, and it just said like doctor, whatever. They didn't realize they were women. They showed up, and they were like, okay, I guess we gotta let women on the ship. Yeah, um, Michelle Lowry was the lady here at UM who was the pioneer. Right, yeah. Legacy. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. There's one on like every coast, every institution, and so Marie Tharp finally got her trip on board um, a research vessel near the end of later in her career. Um, I have never heard about hydrothermal vent habitats for humans, um, but I'm interested to find out more. We have another question here. Yes, uh, my name is Jürgen Kellermäki. I've been on the surface of the oceans, uh, but th this is a very fascinating uh, uh, subject in, in total, and very important. I can see the importance. This, is, this needs to be taken care of. Um, how do the uh, ocean currents, have they left their grooves on the ocean bottoms? Can you see those? And another question I had about the, the greater pollution on the shipping routes. Uh, do, do you see those remnants of, of whatever was left to the, to the big basket, basket from the ships? Thank you very much. Okay, it was a second question about ocean pollution, like pollution on the seafloor? Yes, what the ship, shipping lines. Do you see the shipping lines from the debris aligning them, or, oh. or, or do you see the, the first one question was the ocean currents. Have they left the mark, or are they, why are they too wide so they don't make a groove, or mm. something like this, or erosion? Can you see the erosion from the, from the ocean currents? Because the cold currents normally they go below and quite deep. Yeah, so um, I actually want to go back to one of the, is the clicker here? There's one, um, that map that I showed you, oopsies, that map I showed of, uh-oh. Um, oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> the map I showed of the, um, the, Ind the Indian Ocean actually has a really great representation of, um, so you can see these big fans. These are big sediment fans that is basically all erosion from the Himalayas, and it's just draining out through these deltas. And so you can see just how, much, how far this spreads. This sediment here is sometimes like 12, 12 miles deep. It's huge, it, it, yeah, definitely land and ocean interact. And you can see it in, the, in places like this. Um, so yeah, so definitely that it's interacting. Um, in terms of pollution from shipping lines, I, I don't know much about that. Um, you can see on other maps like uh, here, you can see here that these are, these are the maps of shipping lines. So um, we've mapped shipping routes, and so you can kind of trace where ships go by just these lines. Whether there's pollution or debris left over after them, I'm not exactly sure. 
Um, clearly, there'd be more underwater noise in those areas from shipping, for sure. So there would be more impact on, on animals there from the noise. Hi, good evening. Thank you for your presentation. Very clear. Uh, <clears throat> since to my knowledge, there is no version, a uh, masculine version of mermaids, I think it's just right that women should go down deep there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I have a question besides that. that I agree. I was wondering if your li in your life, is there a special event in your youth or something that determined that you would be looking down so deep? And um, the other question is, uh, is there any trace down there of, uh, some people talk about a continent, uh, Atlantide or something like that. Is there any trace of anything going on that could suggest its existence? Oh, um, that's a really good question. So I think I'm gonna take your second question because I'm just more of a journalist and don't wanna focus on myself as much. Um, so the lost city of Atlantis, it's a beautiful myth. I wish it was real. But one thing that I like to tell people is that um, we have lost so much land since the last ice age. So, so much seafloor is now, uh, um, used to be land. So since the last ice age, um, all these glaciers melted 8,000 years ago and it covered up all these coastlines where early humans lived. Um, Florida is a really good example of this. The state has lost roughly 40% of its landmass since the Ice Age. And so there is, in my opinion, a lost city of Atlantis down there. And it is, it's on the seabed near coastlines where there's so much human history still to discover. And one of the chapters in the book, I actually go diving with these underwater archeologists who are using um, seabed mapping techniques to find um, old quarry sites that are still down on the, the seafloor. And um, for years and years and years, archeologists kind of dismissed this kind of ar underwater archeology span because they thought that the ocean had just ruined all the sites. You know, how could any human artifacts still exist after thousands and thousands of years? But we're discovering that a lot of these sites are remarkably intact. So. My answer is that yes, there's a lost city of Atlantis. It's down there. It's just off the coastline. Thank you. Thank you. I'm David Dia. I'm a faculty here. I was wondering whether you think that the new agreement that the United Nations signed last year on biodiversity conservation in the high seas will help us develop mining in a more sustainable way? That's a really great question. Um, so the BBJN, um, so the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, so, oh wait, NJ, um, that was recently um, agreed on by, it was adopted by UN nations, but it has not been ratified yet. So I actually have a tab on my computer where I watch all the countries come in. Palau is the only one who has ratified um, the, the BBNJ. And um, what this treaty would do is that it would actually establish some, some rules, some laws for the high seas that have really never been, I mean, they've been there, but they haven't really been followed. We do have the 1982 law of the sea, but it hasn't been super effective in safeguarding um, life that lives there, biodiversity that lives there. So um, one thing that was sort of said at the ISA in Jamaica was um, the, the BBNJ, that those negotiations were kind of happening in tandem to the deep sea mining negotiations. And so people would sort of be talking in Jamaica about these mining rules and this mining code. Well, meanwhile, they know that there's this separate treaty that's coming along and it could basically change everything that's in the mining code. So now we're getting to the point where the, the treaty is starting to be ratified, hopefully. More countries will ratify it. Um, and so there's this awareness that things could shift really quickly, but um, it, it's, it's unclear whether it will be able to, to um, regulate mining, but people expect that it should if it does get ratified and if it does go through. So, um, so really, deep sea mining sort of does, 
it does need something like a treaty like BBNJ to sort of come in and help regulate because we do have this vacuum right now. So I think there is some hope and some expectation that the treaty could help if it gets ratified, so. Yes, um, in the beginning of your lecture, you, uh, with that lovely young lady who should have gotten the credit, uh, you said that she was uh, mapping and studying the six deepest sites on the ocean, or in the ocean, but with so much of the ocean unmapped, how do we know, uh, are these the six deepest sites we've found so far, mm -hmm. or do we know those are the six deepest sites? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, five deepest sites. Five. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, really great question. So we have actually, you could say that we have mapped the ocean already. Um, all the world maps that you will see on Google, um, you can go on there and you can look at what seem like pretty detailed maps. And that's because um, the, the seabed has been mapped totally, 100%, it's been mapped by satellites. So it's done in this very counterintuitive way where satellites are measuring the gravity and the surface of the, of the ocean and then they can make a, basically a prediction or an estimate on what the seafloor is like. But these maps are really, really bad. They're like four kilometers resolution. So, um, and that's how much, the, how deep the ocean is in some places. So we, we pretty much know the general shape and so we can say that those you know, five deepest points are the, the deepest points because we have this sort of broader, more general map, but um, it's just not good enough to, 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 to say anything um, deeper or more profound about the, the ocean. We're at like a place where we need to go further and we need to get greater clarity, but we do have that sort of base map that shows us. Sorry? Yes, so that's another chapter in the book. There's, um, so when CBA 2030 kicks off in 2017, there's a lot of optimism that they're gonna make that 2030 deadline on time. Um, they picked that deadline of 2030 because that was based on how many ships were available, how many sonars were available, but they always knew that 13 years was gonna be really ambitious because they'd done a bunch of studies, the mappers had done a bunch of studies saying that it would take one survey ship a thousand years to map the entire ocean, unconstrained by any depth. And um, they expected that they were gonna make up any shortfalls in that 13 years with crowdsourcing or with drones. Drones is becoming hugely important in ocean mapping today. So I went to a drone factory in one chapter in the book called Sail Drone. Um, they're based out of Alameda. They also, I think, just opened a headquarters here in Florida, in St. Petersburg recently. And they're doing incredible things with drones. In 2021, they sent a drone through a Category 5 hurricane um, in the Caribbean. And we saw the first video from inside, like the eye of a hurricane. And so ocean mappers were saying to me, like, these drones are black magic when it comes to ocean mapping. Just a couple of years ago, they never could imagine this happening. So these drones have been able to go around Antarctica, they've crossed oceans by themselves, but there's always gonna be a human managing them back on shore. So um, they're not just gonna go out, they're not gonna go rogue across the ocean, hopefully. <laughs> one last. Thank you so much. We're gonna do one last question. Hi. Um, so I'm a student here at UM. I'm actually reading your book for a class. I've enjoyed it very much. Um, and then one of, one of the things that I've been wondering while reading it is what kind of gave you like the inspiration to research o ocean mapping specifically and I guess what your thought process was while writing it. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think probably a lot of people have heard that cliche that we know more about the surface of Mars and the moon than we do the seafloor. Um, and every time I heard that cliche, it was always in like an article or a newspaper or something like that, and they would never explain it. They'd just like go on, and I'd be like, wait a second, like go back, like what happened? Why haven't we mapped? Uh, why don't we know the bottom of the, the seafloor? Um, and 
yeah, it just kind of perplexed me for all these reasons. There's billions of dollars being poured into space exploration, um, even though you know, distant planets really will have no impact on our daily life and um, on our day-to-day -day life. And so um, I started to sort of think about this cliche a little bit more. And um, when you talk to ocean scientists, they have sort of beat their head against the wall trying to figure out why space is more popular than the ocean. Um, you know, is it religious? Is it political? Is it because we can see the moon, but we can't see the bottom of the ocean? And so I started to, to dig into the cliche a little bit more, and that's when I found out that it was about mapping and the fact that we'd mapped the, uh, we'd mapped the moon and Mars perfectly, all these other planets, but we hadn't mapped the bottom of the seafloor. And so that's when I, I realized that, you know, I really wanted to dig into that question and figure out why we hadn't done that. Um, and then the map, as I was writing the book, the map sort of became this metaphor, this really inspirational metaphor for the whole book, which is like, if we could ever equal out this disparity between space and ocean exploration, um, you know, what would that look like? And, you know, when we finally finished the map, just trying to keep in mind that that's sort of the baseline for, for um, starting all this work and making so many more interesting and important discoveries about the ocean. Yeah. Thank you very much. I want to invite everybody to come back on uh, February 27th. <laughs> we have our speaker, Andy Mann, and um, that will wrap us up for the evening. Thank you again for coming to our Sea Secrets. And thank you. Thank you, Laura.